So, share screen. Hopefully that Recording in progress. It's working. Okay. Well, and welcome everybody. It is now 2 p.m. in the California slash Pacific time zone and 5 p.m. for those of you uh, intrepid people who have stayed with us throughout the day on the East Coast. And what time is it in New Zealand, Christina? It is just nine o'clock in the morning, but tomorrow already on the 28th yes. of um, April. Perfect. Well, uh, we're grateful to have you here describing how to demystify digital ethics and e-portfolios. Um, I'm going to do some logistics and then introduce you and then hand over the talking stick. So. Perfect. Um, for those of you who didn't catch the little voice, we are being recorded for our colleagues who couldn't join us in real time. Uh, and we know that um, the Zoom captions are activated, but if you need to turn them on for yourself, you can use the closed caption button and choose show subtitle or if um, you've reduced the size of your screen or maybe if you're on the phone um, use the more button with the three dots to find that option last we encourage questions and comments in the chat um, and toward the end of the hour we'll share how we can continue the conversation online in Padlet Christina has already shared the link for that as well so without further ado I'd like to introduce introduce Christina Huffner from Catalyst and she is working on Project Mahara and other great things out in New Zealand. So, Christina, take it away. Thank you very much, Kevin, for, for the introduction and also, of course, for organizing or co-organizing uh, the Peralta Equity Conference uh, right now and over the next three days. It's really fantastic to be amongst this wonderful community again and share some of the work that um, I've been doing over the last year together with um, a lot of other people and kind of give you a little bit of an update um, through today's presentation, Demystifying Digital Ethics in ePortfolios. The links to the presentation are online. The first one is just for right now. So um, if you go there, you can click links immediately and the slides will advance while I'm talking. Um, under presentation resources, you will have access to a download PDF version of the slides. And then in the Padlet, uh, you can put your questions in particular after the session, if you have any. And right now, it would probably be good to focus on the chat. So please do have your fingers ready on the keyboard because there will be some questions for you during um, our session today. Now I just need to make sure that I'm also getting to the other slides. Um, so as Kevin said, um, I'm Christina Hoppner and um, I live in Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. But as you can probably guess from my accent, um, I'm not a native Kiwi. Um, I was born in Germany and lived there for the most part of my life and then also in a couple of other countries for various times before moving down south um, to the kind of almost bottom of the world um, in Aotearoa in the middle of 2010 uh, to start my job at Catalyst, which is a, a software development company. We have offices now in a number of parts of the world because Kiwis tend to travel. So they kind of go overseas and then they like to stay. And so we've had the opportunity to open offices also abroad. And um, since 2010, I've been working on the Mahara project that is an open source ePortfolio platform because Catalyst pretty much only works with open source software. So we develop open source software like Mahara um, and we also um, help create websites and other applications for our clients 
based on open source software products, therefore giving them more control over the platform itself. And um, especially also where data is going. So a lot of the things that we are talking about in the context of uh, digital ethics and also equity can actually be done via open source software. And so I'm in a very privileged position to be working with a team here in um, New Zealand on a platform that is used around the world by educators um, in order to create, maintain and also showcase their professional work and also their uh, personal learning in, in the software Mahara. Since September 2019, I'm also a member of, I've, I've also been a member of the Digital Ethics Task Force um, by ABLE, the, associ the Association of Authentic, Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning that works quite a bit with ePortfolios. And that organization is based in the United States, uh, but the community is also international, which is fantastic to see what similarities there are, but also what differences there are across the globe in terms of ePortfolio practice. And so what I'm presenting today is um, predominantly work that we have done in the task force over the last almost three years um, in regards to digital ethics, because that is our conference topic. Many of you don't really need um, a, an explanation of what to, or a definition of what digital ethics is, um, but just as a, as a small refresher and to kind of get us into today's session and what we are looking at, because um, with digital ethics, of course, we are looking at um, online programs, um, software, and also how people interact online. So I'd kind of like us to, to get into that uh, frame of mind because today's two big terms are digital ethics and ePortfolios. So writing comments has a very simple, nice short definition of uh, digital ethics, also referring to ethics itself and says that because ethics refers to the way groups and individuals relate to, treat and resolve issues with each other, digital ethics then encompasses how users and participants in online environments interact with each other and the technologies and platforms used to engage. And so all the things that we are doing online. Now, the second big important term in today's session is ePortfolios. So what is an ePortfolio for you? Do you already have experience with ePortfolios? Please use the chat or unmute yourself um, to briefly share what you think an ePortfolio is, um, either for you or if you have a formal definition um, or if you just have an inkling. And you're welcome to use the chat or the um, microphone itself. I see a couple of people in here who, who will probably know really, really well what portfolios are. So please do feel free to share your, your insight. I'll chime in, Christina. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, even though I'm no longer in the role of online teaching and learning manager at San Francisco State, um, we were the ePortfolio uh, Center of Excellence for the Cal State system, um, where we really worked hard to help a number of disciplines, um, encourage students to showcase their work, meet different outcomes at the course and program level, and um, also share their work with people who may not know a whole lot about the academic setting, especially those first generation students who wanted to share what they were learning and doing with um, family and friends and community members back home. So um, I'll mute myself and see if anybody else wants to share how they are working with ePortfolios at their organizations. 
Thank you very much, Kevin. And you, you've mentioned actually a lot of the things of what ePortfolios can be, because there's just a really wide variety. And so you said showcasing learning, sharing that with others in the institution, but also outside, and also looking at that learning and providing that evidence. Mm -hmm. Hi, Christina. Hi, this Gail. Is Gail. Hey. Um, I'd also like to add another perspective, and I think um, a portfolio, whether digital or the big book, I think it requires conversations around learning, and it brings an audience in to share what you know and how you know it. So it kind of gives authenticity to the evidence that you've collected. Wonderful. Thank you very much for bringing up the conversation, Gil. That is indeed also for me a very important aspect because we often learn from our engagements with others and can therefore enhance our own learning through that. And then we also have um, a comment from Arcadia. Um, online portfolios for projects and experience showcase your work in collaborations. Yes. Definitely the showcase is, is a big aspect of it. Um, we also have learning portfolios and uh, developmental portfolios or assessment portfolios. So portfolios can really cover a wide range of scenarios where they can be used in order to um, exhibit that authentic experience on, and the authentic evidence that uh, was collected during an experience. So for me, kind of in a way, all these things, all the things that you can do in an e-portfolio culminate in, in five activities um, of which Gail and uh, Kevin had made references to already. And so I'd just very briefly like to share them with you. And in English, we have the advantage that they all start with a C. So that's why they are the five C's for me. But before we can actually really have a portfolio, we need to create that evidence or the evidence needs to be done so that we actually can put something into the portfolio. And that can be very in, done in very different ways, either an actual experience that is filmed or you um, speak or you take a photo or you write something. And then when we get into the portfolio, the portfolio is there to collect all of that evidence. So you could imagine it's kind of like a big box where everything goes in um, that you've experienced. However, um, the very important part then for the portfolio activity comes in during the curation of that evidence, because oftentimes we don't really want to or should be sharing everything that we've done, because that's could be quite overwhelming um, to, to somebody who's viewing our portfolio because there's just too much going on. And so the curation allows us to narrow things down to the important aspects and also to help us reflect on that learning evidence in order to put it into context to make connections between um, the different uh, experiences and therefore really make it clear what we actually want to say in a particular portfolio. And then as Gail said, we have conversations on the portfolio. And be that if you have a ring binder, then you might have that conversation in person. Um, whereas when you're online, you might have a conversation in comments or on a chat, but also still have the opportunity to converse in person around the portfolio. And through that conversation, you can also connect with other people. And depending on the portfolio platform you use, you might even be able to create uh, collaborative portfolios or engage in wider community of practice conversations. So a lot of possibilities there to work with portfolios in, in a different way to normal assigned tasks or assigned activities in the classroom um, that are graded. Now, putting all of that together, we have the digital ethics principles in ePortfolios that Abel has uh, created over the last three years. And um, there we are looking at how can we create portfolios 
that follow digital ethics principles because it's such an important aspect of the, the work we do and things that we need to be aware of. And I put the link to the principles into the chat for you to go to. And so you might think, well, wow, wow, there are 13 principles all together. Um, isn't that a bit hard to do? And how can we get digital ethics into ePortfolio practice? Well, this is what I'm going to, to look at with you over the next um, few minutes. Uh, but because I do, and that's why the title of the presentation is Demystifying Digital Ethics in ePortfolios, because I do want to show you that um, a lot of things you may have already done or you may be thinking about, um, but not saying that everything will be easy because there's definitely a lot of things that where we can change our practice, where we might want to improve our practice and see how we can be in a space where equity plays a very big role, where we look at the concerns of all learners and also of staff and lecturers and faculty members working with ePortfolios in order to give everybody access to it. So let's look at the principles themselves and um, please do feel free to put your own thoughts to these answers into the chat and we can get to them as time allows. The principles are not really in an order. Um, I've picked one that kind of made sense to me for this particular presentation. Um, but they are not really numbered on the website officially because what we wanted to avoid is to make it look like one principle is more important than another. Uh, they all have their own place. They all have their importance and contribute to the overall picture of um, creating portfolios with a digital ethics lens. What I wanted to start with today is what can you do to promote awareness? So with a portfolio task, you could, or how do you make people aware that digital ethics should actually be a topic in ePortfolio practice? Well, if you're already doing digital ethics and talk about equity at your organization, then that is a really, really good start because then you are already in that mindset. Um, you are already asking institutional stakeholders questions about where portfolio resources might be stored, who is responsible, what strategies you have in order to implement um, and, or in order to implement digital ethics or where you could uh, see biases and the, um, how you can ensure that everybody has access. So awareness is one of the first steps to know that there is work to be done, that there are questions to be asked. The second question you might want to ask yourself is, what types of support do you have at your institution? So is there funding available to distribute resources for developing um, activities for teaching an ePortfolio course? And um, are, there um, are there people and also technology available to develop and provide training and support on not just the platform, but also digital ethics principles, um, teaching methodologies, ways that ePortfolios can be implemented. Um, we've heard earlier that you can showcase po use, use portfolios to showcase learning, that you can use it for learning experiences, um, and that you might also use it to showcase your collaboration. So lots of different possibilities there. And how do you make sure that those people wanting to do all of that have adequate uh, support available? Because oftentimes we do forget that when something new is implemented at an organization, then it's just said, oh yeah, just do that. And it's just a new tool and technology, but it is actually not. Um, if you haven't worked with portfolios before, there's quite a bit of thinking that sh should go into the conversation because there is a shift of how to organize students, how to work with them, and that should be recognized. 
and uh, should also be made sure that there, there is enough support from the institution available for it. And once we have the support, then how can you practice digital literacy is necessary to develop the uh, to develop effective portfolios. So again, identify and share strategies for storing and attaching uh, artifacts. Maintain ex expectations that portfolios should be accessible. That um, the activities themselves implement universal design principles teach students digital literacy skills like um, using images, um, making images smaller so that they could also work on mobile devices and the like. And then also, of course, very importantly, and that is of, um, the main topic of our current, present, uh, current conference, is how can you encourage diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonization? So that is a topic that uh, Kevin and I looked at particular last year for the Able Digital Ethics Task Force. And typically you might hear DEI or DEIB, um, but we did want to include decolonization because there are a number of um, questions that should be asked in that context and not just muddled up in, in the other words and in the other concepts. Because yeah, working with um, indigenous peoples can be very different, um, but very rewarding and also impact very positively work you do with any other group. And so there are lots of strategies to implement digital ethics in regards to DEIBD. And that starts from creating resources with an equity lens, um, then facilitating conversations in a class to find out who people are, to learn more about your learners. Also providing support and resources for students and educators encouraging students to ask questions, but also being mindful um, that some people might not want to share everything of themselves and therefore setting really, really good expectations um, at the start when implementing these ePortfolio activities in order to make people feel safe and welcome. And a lot of the things that we've looked at for this principle uh, came actually out of um, conversations that Kevin already had within the Peralta Community College environment and community, which then helped us shape that principle and see how that can be applied to ePortfolios. And we've kind of talked about support and practice um, and support has also come up in the uh, in, in the principle for DEIBD. And so in a way it all culminates in making labor visible. So how do you make the labor visible that goes into the creation of activities and the portfolios? Because as Gail had mentioned in, in the chat, talking about support is, um, is very important. And that also means that it needs, there, there needs to be the awareness at an organization that there is time that needs to go into that it can't just be put on somebody else. What I don't want to do is kind of make you fearful that implementing ePortfolios is such a huge thing that you shouldn't be doing it. Um, definitely not. It um, often might mean rearranging responsibilities or seeing where things can be done differently, but definitely being aware of that there is labor involved and that is labor both on the faculty side and also the student side. And labor in our context does not just mean the actual creation or working with technology, but also emotional labor. So all the effort that goes in revealing potentially very personal things um, and dealing with that and being mindful, but also then yeah, looking at digital literacies, acknowledging um, all the things that have gone into the portfolio work.
And yes, being creative does take time. Uh, see, oftentimes we can't just flip a switch and suddenly come up with uh, something that is inc incredibly unique um, or that we want to talk about. So really looking at all of those aspects and rewarding that labor, m acknowledging it and um, really value it in order to value it is important for us um, so that e-portfolio activities aren't regarded as this extra thing that is the most stressful one. And kind of when we have our portfolio, what evaluation practices would you consider that are equitable? And many of you probably already employ a lot of those, namely that there could be a rubric um, that could then be shared with students and discussed or students even contribute to the rubric. But rubrics aren't just the only thing. So do look at what evaluation mechanisms can be developed uh, that are informed by research, aligned to the learning outcomes of a co particular course or even just a class, and include input from multiple and diverse stakeholders, for example, um, so that the activity is really integrated and the portfolio work is integrated rather than standing on the side where students and faculty might not really know why they are doing it. Now we are getting to a few more technical uh, principles that are not less important though than the more pedagogical ones. And yes, uh, Kevin, evaluation practices could also allow people to showcase different knowledge traditions. Because what we especially as um, Oh, yeah, in, in our software development for Mahada, what we typically see is that because it's online, a lot of people write text. But that may not be the best way of expressing themselves um, if they are from an indigenous culture where there is a lot of oral history, lots of oral storytelling. And so what the online platform allows us to do, though, is to work with multimedia content so that a reflection from a student could very well be a song or it could be um, orally told and talked about. It could be an image or a video that is being presented rather than just an essay of 200 words or 500 words and a, re and a written reflection. Nowadays, we have so many opportunities to also work with multimedia content that should definitely be explored. And that is where then also though the awareness comes in and rightly so we are also here at the principle of accessibility. How do you make that content then accessible to others? So that could then mean, well, can there be automatic captions at least um, so that a transcript is produced or closed captions made? How is an image described um, in order to make it accessible to those that can't see it? So lots of questions that should already be asked right now um, of educators and also students when they produce content. So those principles are often not even just inherent to e-portfolios. We are just looking at it from the lens of the e-portfolios and where the most impact could be and also where we can provide ideas of how to work with them. Another very big question is how do you ensure equitable access to technology? Not every student might have a laptop or desktop computer available or might have a stable internet connection. Um, during the pandemic, oftentimes we've heard that students were parked out um, in, in their cars in parking lots and fast food restaurants in order to complete their homework because that was the only place where they had internet because it was free Wi-Fi. Um, also, how can we let students know there are te there's technology available by an organization? And also, is the technology that we have access to 
um, suited to work with the electronic platform that was selected for ePortfolio use. Closely related then also is what tools do you use to check cross-platform compatibility? These days, some people might only work on a phone or on a tablet rather than a desktop or laptop computer. Um, how do you go about ensuring that the ePortfolios that are created can be accessed on those devices? Do you give students strategies on hand? Uh, do you teach them about digital literacies and how they can make sure that their content is also accessible somewhere else? Because they might not really know what a viewer of their portfolio um, has access to in terms of uh, device. And one thing that has already been quite established, I think, in the academic landscape is to look at how to respect other rights and reuse permissions and what tools you have available. And that goes all the way from advocating for student ownership of ePortfolios and portability post-graduation so that they can keep their content, um, but also being aware of uh, students knowing what the rights of an institution are when they are creating a portfolio or if they are creating a portfolio for an employer and obtaining then consent for using that or consent for using a shared portfolio that they might have created with two or three others in a group. And also when they are using pictures, kind of knowing, can I use the picture? Um, is it all right to grab that picture from um, an online resource? Is it a Creative Commons licensed picture and the like? So really making sure that we are respecting people's rights on the content that they have created on their intellectual property. And something really for the for using a platform online and ePortfolios aren't the only one where you should be asking that question, but anything that is being used. But in particular with the ePortfolio where we could be sharing quite sensitive information and uh, per personal insights that might not really be going public all the time. Can students on the platform that you use actually um, decide with whom they want to share their portfolio? Do they have private settings available uh, where they can distinguish with whom they want to connect, um, with whom they want to engage in their work, or is it a blanket permission level, um, one size fits all? And therefore also really looking at um, prioritizing maybe portfolios that do have a very comprehensive permissions framework in order to allow for that flexibility, giving students the power to decide with whom they want to share something. And following on from that really is also where and how is your content stored? Um, typically, let's be honest, um, when there are terms and conditions and privacy policies written on, on a website and we register for an account, often we don't really take the time to read through every single word very closely, but skip to the bottom, click the agree button and then go on. But do you actually know what is written in those things then? Do you know where your data is stored? Does the data storage conform with, in the United States, FERPA or maybe even um, HIPAA if you're in a study program that uh, works with, say, psychologists or is in medicine? How do you know where the content is and then also who has access to it? Is it stored in a country that has uh, fewer privacy regulations then are expected from your organization and what does the the provider say about that um, can, do you have can you influence where your data is being stored and that also goes into did you give consent to the data usage so we've gone from the data is stored but do you know who else has access to that beyond the people you have given access to the portfolio. 
because for example if you use a an online website um, a tool that is freely available where you can create an account oftentimes there are ads involved ads on on pages on any pages and that then also means that there's a connection back to that ad provider so what sort of information is then sent back to them is that something that works with the privacy policy at your organization or if you're keeping a personal portfolio is that something that is ethically okay with you or should you be looking for an application um, where you have more control and where you also see more which connections are made to other places And those were the 13 principles that we have for digital ethics in the e-portfolios at the moment. Right now we are in the process of revising a number of those and combining them because you, you might have heard while I was talking that there's quite a bit of overlap between certain principles. And so we of course also want to make it easier for them to be understood and to be worked with. So that's why it is very important then to to iterate over them and see what can be changed new adding new things and removing things that might not be relevant anymore and earlier i asked is it hard to implement uh, digital ethics in e-portfolios and the the question was well if it's well or if it were easy, everybody would be doing it, I guess. And so really it is very important to, oops, sorry, um, very important to keep going and do what you have already started and start maybe with, with a small step and then evolve from there. So here in the picture, you see three climbers. One is ready to go and all set to, take on the next step. The other one just needs to take a little break and sit down. And then there's a third one of whom we are not really seeing so much, but he seems to be, or that person seems to be talking to the second climber who has been sitting down. And so have conversations with people, take a break, take it easy. T um, but then also progress when you're ready to go and make that leap um, go on and um, test things out, test things that work for you, iterate over them and see where you've got to. And then come to conferences like that, where you are in a community that doesn't necessarily work in your topic area, um, but that works in the area of equity and where you can ask the hard questions and we'll get some answers because over the next two days we'll have some more interactive sessions so if you want to learn a little bit more about um, digital ethics in ePortfolios from the task force you're very welcome to come to our session tomorrow at 12 uh, p.m pacific time or then also in June, there is an opportunity to specifically look at that support and practice principle and see where um, you might want to ask questions, um, what you have already tried and what else you might want to do. And so if my clock is correct, we'll have roughly seven minutes um, until the end of the session. So please do feel free to grab the microphone and let's have a chat. I took the words out of my mouth, Christina. Um, I encourage all of the folks here participating to share some ideas that you've got or questions that you have. Now that you've heard about the digital ethics principles, um, where might be your first small step to get started with your own students?
hope I didn't shock everybody into silence but, and overwhelming them with so many principles. And even if you haven't done anything ePortfolio related, um, do those principles resonate with you for the work that you are currently doing in, in education? Mm. Yeah, if we extrapolate beyond the ePortfolios just to mm -hmm. online teaching and learning. Okay, it looks so, like you're getting yeah, ready to talk. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the edge of my seat. Thank you, Christina. This was great, and I really enjoyed learning about these principles. But your question is, you know, where do you start with students, and you know, how do you engage students, and and how do you um, just encourage their ownership and empower them? And I, I think that's where we start with digital ethics, right? Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned this private space. I think students knowing that they have a private space that is solely their own, I think that is how we support them mm -hmm. with digital ethics. I think um, giving them voice and giving them multiple modes, as you said, to you know express themselves we're not all great public speakers or we're not all great writers but you know maybe um you're a better drawer or maybe you're a better whatever it is you know i think okay. portfolios give you that wonderful space to really support students and meet them where they're at yeah correct yeah the wonder thank you so much for for kind of in a way summarizing oh. things very nicely um because it's yeah, you, you could kind of almost think of it's it's a chicken and egg thing because there's so many places where you could start, which one would be the best to start with. But taking a spaces that there should be digital ethics involved and then going from there and building up, seeing what is important and looking at the immediate activity, but also the wider picture and in which context the students are. Earlier, Kevin uh, mentioned also working with uh, first generation students. Um, we've touched on indigenous communities. Um, and so there's lots of different places and we can't just say, okay, what worked in this particular course might work in another one or might work in the same course in a different country because that is never going to work. So we always have to adjust to the local context and by getting to know students, uh, by knowing where the instructor comes from, all of those things are important because we are not just blank pages, but we all have our experience that flows in of who we are. And sorry, I'm just going to add one more thing. I wonder if, you know, I always try to look for the silver lining and I have found a silver lining with COVID. And I think that silver lining is that we have employed this curriculum of care and we've really tried to meet students where we mm -hmm. are. We talked about um, the inequity of internet and all of that. And, and I think COVID has shine, shown a light on mm -hmm. some of these things and we've learned how to address them. So, you know, I think, and portfolios support our efforts in that regard, I think so, so well. So, Definitely. Yeah, so the the last two years have really opened the eyes. Also, I think um, how portfolios can be used in assessment contexts, because oftentimes when we have um, kind of students were ex expected to go on campus, sit an exam for two hours or longer and then go away. But not everybody having Internet access or instructors might fearing well what can students see when when they're at home and do they cheat and all of those things why put a very negative lens on that instead of creating activities authentic activities that have that look at the strength of the student and what they can do out in the world with all the resources available rather than um, doing necessarily a multiple choice test and regurgitating um, what they have learned in class but employing their own thinking reflecting on what they have learned because then that should be very personal and therefore not really easily replicated by another student 
So yes, Gail, I agree with you that over the, the course of the pandemic, we have certainly seen a shift in how portfolios are also used and the possibilities there for them in education. And um, I'm hoping to hear a number of those innovations that have come about for that. Um, what I do know is that Dublin City University, for example, in Ireland, they switched a lot of their assessments away from exams to e-portfolios in order to accommodate students better and make it possible for them also to to finish their classes and get grades. Mm -hmm. So I think, Kevin, that takes us quite to the to 9.45, well, 9.45 for me, um, yes. the end of the session. 9.45 right? a.m. tomorrow. So you are in the future yeah. telling us how um, we can approach e-portfolios and online learning in general with a digital ethics lens. So thank you so much for sharing the principles. And I know that you um, encouraged folks to join us again tomorrow at 12 noon Pacific, which I think is a little bit earlier for you. Yep, it's 7. Maybe yep. 7 a.m. your time um, to continue it and make it a true discussion with more yep. members of the task force. So I encourage everyone to to come back for that. Uh, I would also point out some comments that um, Marjane um, put in the chat about an asset-based approach rather than a deficit-based approach really works and um, loving e-portfolios because students are able to utilize higher order thinking skills. Those are great uh, points to close with. So I'll thank you again, Christina, for your um, wonderful presentation and discussion. Uh, we're going to stop the recording now, but we will um, reconvene here and in rooms B and C for another round of great equity-focused discussions and conversations in just about 15 minutes. So everybody take a bio break and we'll see you back here in just a little bit. Thank you everybody for coming and hope to connect with you in one way or another very soon again. <laughs>